Welcome everybody to the second distinguished lecture of the Vigyan Vigyan Vidushi. We are delighted to have Dr. Ranjita Bhagwan, who is a senior principal researcher at Microsoft Research India. Ranjita Bhagwan is a leading expert in computer systems research. She started her academic career in computer science and engineering with a BTEC in computer science and engineering from the Indian Institute of Technology, Kharagpur, followed by an MS and PhD in computer engineering from the University of California, San Diego. She's worked for more than a decade on applying machine learning to improving system reliability, security, and performance. Her work has focused on using data-driven approaches to improve cloud services and has led to several publications as well as seven tools that are widely used by Microsoft services. Her work has won several awards, including the Best Paper Award at OSDI, one of the leading systems conferences, 2018 OSDI conference. More recently, her work was has been recognized by the ACM, uh, and she is the recipient of the 2020 ACM India Outstanding Contributions to Computing by a Woman Award. I'm quoting from the ACM web page on the award. Ranjita has helped put computer systems research in India on the global map, especially with regard to machine learning for computer systems engineering. Personally, from my end, I have seen Ranjita several times over the years during my visits to Microsoft, but I've never had the opportunity to interact with her either on a personal or professional level. Thanks to Vigyan Vidushi, we have Ranjita here at the PIFR campus delivering the distinguished lecture. Dr. Ranjita should be sharing with us a personal journey with the students. Thank you, Prahlad. Uh, and I hope everybody can hear me fine. I, I, I think so. And uh, let me just first thank uh, the organizers at with Vigyan Vidushi for having me here. It's the first time I've been to TIFR campus and it's been great. It's such a great campus to be in. I'm sure you all feel the same way. Um, so uh, I'm going to talk about uh, my journey through systems and networking research. And I'll the journey starts many years ago because I'm quite old, you see. Uh, but before I go there, uh, let me first, uh, okay. Yeah, let me just tell you a short introduction about myself. I was born and brought up in Kolkata. And then I uh, did my BTEC in IIT Kharagpur. Um, and then uh, my PhD at UC San Diego. And now I've been at Microsoft Research for about 15 years or so. Um, my hobbies include uh, music. I like different kinds of music. And I also like uh, going on treks. So if any of you would like to talk about music or trekking uh, at any point during the talk or after, I'm happy to do that. And also in the rest of the talk, please feel free to interrupt me. I can make sure that I finish my talk within the designated time. Uh, but it would be great to keep this interactive. My uh, uh, This is my outline slide, and it's also a timeline of what I'm going to be talking about. So in 1998, I graduated from IIT Kharagpur and joined UC San Diego. And in uh, 2000, I published my first paper on fast and scalable priority queue architectures for network switches. Uh, then in 2004, I finished my thesis. I defended my thesis on uh, highly available peer-to-peer -peer systems. In 2007, I moved to India. So in the interim, I worked for two years at IBM Research, uh, where I contributed to a code to a stream processing system, but I won't be talking about that. In 2018, um, I, uh, I won this Bates Paper Award, but mainly based, based on work I had done for the last two, three years on data-driven development and debugging for cloud services. And now, uh, currently, I'm working on application-aware resource provisioning in Microsoft's cloud services to make them much more efficient and cost, uh, you know, uh, frugal. So apart from all these highlights, I uh, first, firstly, I, I'll be talking about two parts. So part one is before I joined Microsoft and part two is after I joined Microsoft. Uh, apart from these, I will also be talking about two low points in my career. Uh, through some stories uh, on when I was when things didn't go very well for me. Uh, so hopefully uh, the point is that you know everything is not a highlight in anybody's career, right? There are various low points as well. So part one of my talk. 
so I'll start with grad school. So this is a photo of me many years ago um, and many kilograms ago as well. Uh, and with my two advisors uh, who also looked like students at that point of time, now they have beards and they're all gray. Um, so Jeff Volker and Stefan Savage. So when I joined in 1998, computer networking was a very hot topic, right? Because the internet was growing like crazy and everybody was depending on the web and the web was exploding like anything, right? AI was absolutely not hot. If you were working in AI, people would look down on you. It was like that. <coughs> so as a result, I joined a group that worked on computer networking. My advisor at the time <coughs> was one Professor Bill Lin. And he said, Ranjita, here's a paper. And he handed me a paper by uh, Professor Nick McEwen at Stanford and uh, Mark Horowitz as well. <coughs> Excuse me, sorry. I'm just um, got a little bit of scratchy throat. So he said, this paper talks about a switch architecture. All right. But if you look at the figure on the right, the switch architecture has queues. <laughs> and each queue has some number of priorities. In this case, only four priorities. So my advisor said, Ranjita, somehow figure out so that we can do this with a priority number being um, specified as an integer. So you should be allowed two power 32 priority values. So just build a high speed priority queue with two power 32 values. So he told me that much and left. And uh, so I, what I did was then I started looking at the state of the art and priority queues, right? Oh, before I uh, progress, let me just get a show of hands for people who've done courses in networking, undergrad or grad, not too many, and operating systems, more on operating systems. Thank you. All right. Uh, people know uh, what a heap is? Yeah, great. All right, so when I looked at uh, the state of the art for priority queue architectures, so there were hardware priority queues and software priority queues. So hardware priority queues, uh, calendar queues, essentially you just have a separate queue per priority level, all right? Uh, so, but they, these things manage only a very small number of priorities, but they're super fast. They use top of the line memory uh, technologies. They're super fast and very expensive because they use SRAM, which is expensive memory. Then there were software priority queues. So first thing that comes to mind with that is a heap. So a heap, it scales very well, right? You can support two power 32 priority levels. And if it's stored in DRAM, it's cheap also, but it's got order login, NQ and DQ operations, right? So <clears throat> I was wondering how to bring these two together. So how do I implement a relatively cheap order one heap using hardware, right? Because we can't do it in software. So thought about this for multiple months and uh, made two observations on this. The first is that hardware is sunk cost. So if you um, buy a memory chip, 16 gigs or 32 gigs memory, then you have already spent the money on it. So what's the point of reducing your data structure to eight gigs or 16 gigs in hardware I'm talking about? hardware. If you're doing it in software, it still makes sense to co collapse your uh, data structure to use sm as small uh, memory footprint as possible. But in hardware, it's already sunk cost. You've already invested in that. So as a result of that, we can have heaps, priority queues, like this is a heap, um, but make these holes or empty things in the middle of the heap a first class property of the of the data structure itself right and when you allow that to happen turns out you can do order one nq and dq operations and the second reason why that's possible is because hardware allows pipelining so it's not really order one it's cheating but uh, what you can do is while you are doing an nq or a dq operation on the first few levels of the priority queue you can do an NQ or DQ for the previous version, previous operation on levels three and four here, right? So 
these are two observations. Um, of course, if you remember your heap, NQ and DQ, one of them works bottom from the bottom to the top and the other works from the top to the bottom. Um, so we had to play around with those to make both work top to bottom because otherwise you can't pipeline them. Right. So we had to add some extra state, some registers on the side in this case, uh, which were needed to make things work from top to bottom. And we designed this pipeline cheap and scalable priority cube. So this was the first piece of work I did. Right. And the idea sort of came to me. I was working alone on this. So I was really proud of myself. Wow. I got the all these cool ideas. I presented this at this Infocom 2000. Uh, um, conference um, and it you know I bought a suit I wore a suit I went gave the presentation I've never worn a suit since um, and this also turned out as an exercise in a network algorithmics book it's a textbook for networking and I also heard in the grapevine that there were several startups who use this idea in their product right so I was very happy and I was like on cloud nine that I'm this great researcher, I can do some great research, right? So, and, and this is the point at which I'm going to talk about story number one of the low point in my research career. So after this paper got published, <clears throat> I came back and then uh, my advisor left, right? So when my advisor left, I thought, uh, let me try and figure out what to do. But I was an immature researcher. I, I just could not think of what my PhD thesis topic should be. So I just spent six months, eight months just doing nothing, pretty much listening to music and pretending to work and doing some coursework on the side. Uh, and then that's at the point at which I said, OK, this won't do. I have to change my advisor. So then I went uh, to various people I sent email to various people and said hey uh, I'm really interested in your work can you please take me as a student some said not interested too busy one of them said come and talk to me so I went I spoke to the person and they asked me what have you done so I told them what I've done with this hardware priority queue very proudly then they said you're talking about supporting two power 32 um, uh, priority levels why why bother four, eight, 16 should be enough, no? So then I thought and I said, okay, I'm not sure why. Uh, I'm sorry, I don't know why I did that, but I just did it because I could, I guess. And my advisor told me to do it. And they laughed. And But they let me in anyway. They took me as a student. But then after that, right, they also left to start a company. So this was a time when the dot-com boom was happening. So again, I was sort of left with no idea what I should do. Uh, spent about a year in that lab. Uh, again, I didn't do any research, right, for one, one, another one year. But that was the time when I was, I really learned a lot about how computers work. So we would, you know, open up computers, put in these hot swappable disks, put in uh, memories, graphic unit, graphical processing units. Uh, at that time, they were just called graphics uh, processors. Um, so all of that and just got my hands dirty with Linux, understood how Linux internals worked. So I did all that, but I just didn't do any research. So again, I got into the whole idea of uh, getting, finding a new set of advisors. So that's when I bumped into Stefan and Jeff, my ultimate advisors. First thing I asked them is, are you going, leaving to start a company? They said, no. So <laughs> I said, okay, fine, <laughs> then I can join you. So that was a pretty low point, right? Uh, uh, because I spent about two years just shopping around for a set of advices in some sense. So next comes my thesis work, which started after I joined uh, Stefan Savage and Jeff Volker's lab. And uh, this, this is the time when peer-to-peer -peer systems were very hot, okay? There were these uh, softwares called Napster and Nutella. I don't know if any of you know uh, what these were or torrents right you might know what torrents are so the idea was you could download all this uh, you know pirated music or movies from peers peers meaning other hosts just like yourself and there was very rarely a server involved because if there's a server involved you shut down the server you shut down the whole system right so rather than that these software spread all these files all around these hosts 
and uh, you couldn't if, even if you shut down one host or a bunch of hosts you always had a bunch of other hosts that you could download content from so it was illegal but from a academic standpoint it was a very interesting paradigm for running a system so my advisor said ranjita why don't you look at peer to peer systems people have looked at routing of traffic and all that but they haven't looked at building high uh, highly available peer to peer systems how do you provide availability in these systems like you always have the content available because they are all running on home machines or office machines which remember at the time 20 years ago people would turn off their machine at 9 turn on their machine at 9 o'clock in the morning turn it off at 5 or the other way around depending on whether it was an office machine or a home machine so think about doing that so again i got guidance from my advisor saying look into that problem so at that point i said the first thing i need to do is to understand what is the characteristic what are the characteristics of machines in these networks how much availability do we actually have right how do we measure availability so first thing to do you have a bunch of hosts which are running some peer to peer network you collect all their ip addresses okay then every hour or every half an hour you ping them you send a ping um it's like a probe if you know you haven't taken networking class so you send a packet probe it's like a request and you get a response back if that machine is up and running if it's not then you don't get anything back so you know if the machine was available or not so just do this every hour run this for a month and you get some characteristics of availability <clears throat> right so this is the way that you do it but uh, there was a problem here when i started doing this and the problem is of dhcp aliasing so i don't know if you guys know what dhcp is does anybody know what dhcp is all right let me explain this okay i'm going to use the board that's okay all right so whenever any of your machines whenever you use using your wifi at home or sure yeah uh, when you use your wifi at home for instance right you turn on your machine let's say this is your machine right you turn on your machine you need an ip address to communicate with the outside world how do you go about getting an ip address you contact a server which is called the dynamic host configuration protocol dhcp server saying please give me an ip address and then let's say this one gives you an ip address of 10.10. say 1.22 right now you have this address for some time let's say in this case for for argument sake half an hour after half an hour the lease expires and then you make another request and now you may get back 10.10.1.50 right so your ip address is dynamic it changes with time right you don't have a constant ip address i mean nowadays things are slightly different but even so there's no guarantee you have the same ip address so if you collect all these ip addresses and you start pinging them as in are you available or not and if you're pinging 10.10.1.22 right you get a response first but after half an hour when you ping this you don't get a response even though the machine is up right it just has a different ip address so this was the problem with these ip address based availability monitoring i hope at least Uh, some the the idea itself is clear why this causes a problem because the name of the machine changes with time so you also have to change the names of the machines or the ip addresses but collecting these ip addresses is not possible it's it's very difficult to collect ip addresses because um every half an hour it's changing where do you actually go and collect ip addresses so instead of that what we did was we noticed this other peer to peer system called overnet which assigned uh, an application level id to the machine and that application level id did not change right 
So it doesn't matter what you're doing at the IP level. So this is the IP level. Here's the application level. Here you'll have some other address, say D, E, 4, 1, 2, F. And that never changes, right? So you can build a probe at the application level and say, are you available, right? So you collect all these application level IDs. So we wrote a crawler to in this overnet software, which went around to all the machines and collected all of their application IDs. We got thousands of them, stored it. And then every now and then in the application level network protocol, we sent a request, are you available? This particular name, whatever DEF. And then it responded, right? And so you got rid of this aliasing effect of the IP address uh, level by doing this. So uh, this graph just shows what we found. I, I won't go into too much detail, but people at the time thought, you know, the availability of the machines followed the green line. But then we showed, uh, actually, it wasn't that bad. It followed the red line. Uh, y axis here is percentage of hosts. Uh, X axis is the host availability. So this is a CDF. Um, red line is better availability. So that means uh, you can potentially build systems on these kinds of machines. It's not as bad as we thought. So the next observation we made by probing this, is, so this is 2,400 machines that we probed over time, right? Y axis is number of hosts. So we, we noticed this pattern, right? So we said, let's break this down into two. The first is this diurnal pattern. And then the other is this gradual drop, right? Because there are these home machines which slowly decay, they leave the, they delete the application and so on. So if you put, <coughs> if you put files on these machines, right? Or replicas, you'll have to uh, do or repair or put in more replicas to take care of both these effects. <coughs> <laughs> Sorry. So long story short, right? Using these availability measurements and um, using um, different techniques for doing replication, using erasure coding as well, we built this whole system. So this distributed hash table here was the lowest level of our system. It was a routing layer. So if you sent uh, traffic, it would route it to the right application ID that I told you about. That was already developed at MIT by a group. So we built on top of that. We built a storage system on top of that. We built a redundancy engine. You know, if the machines are dying very fast, then you put in many more replicas. You, did, you measure the availability. You determine how much replication you need. We did all of this, right? So that at the end of the day, I could actually save a file into my file system that I have built. So I could uh, say, for instance, touch or CP or whatever, and it was working on a file system that we had built. And uh, I couldn't do this alone. I did this along with uh, multiple uh, other grad students. And it also taught me how to collaborate on these kinds of projects. But it was very, very gratifying and very, very satisfying to actually use my own system to store my files, right? So doing this also taught me to think, you know, from top to bottom about systems uh, and not just the one cute idea, right? One cute idea is great, but you have to think through the whole system about why you're building it. How will you do the routing? That might not be the place where you're innovating, but you have to think about all of these problems. How do you deal with availability, performance, security, and all of that? So this whole process taught me that. So that was the first part of my talk, which is good because I think I'm halfway through my time as well. Uh, any thoughts or questions at this point? All right. So the second part of my talk is about work. I've, yeah. Primarily peer to peer, no, where you have these sort of changing addresses and stuff. But yeah. This also would apply to regular sort of the. Not really. This was a problem only when you were thinking of building things on these home machines and all of that. So that problem was there then. Now, now no. 
that whole uh, peer to peer systems are also very few of them exist some of them still exist uh, for instance skype uses peer to peer uh, connections when you do calls for instance yeah all right all right so now uh, time for the second part of second low point of my career um so I started in Microsoft Research in 2007, and I was very happy to come back to India from the US. Uh, and I started working on this data-driven angle, right? Use data from systems, learn some insights about the system, and feed it back into system design, diagnostics. So the first piece of work I did was home, home networking related. So when you're setting up your home network, at least at that point of time, things didn't work very often out of the box. So how can we collect data from multiple home networks, working and non-working configuration information about the home network? And let's throw that into a machine learning algorithm and figure out why it's not working or how can we suggest some fixes so that the home network starts working. So <clears throat> we did this work. Uh, we use decision trees to actually learn which configurations work, which configurations don't. Uh, paper got published. Uh, then we went to the Windows folks and said, hey, we have this really cool uh, way of doing diagnostics. Can you potentially use this in Windows? Um, and they said, this is all fine, but where? how do we get data, right? Data from users is really difficult to get especially networking data, because getting it from the Windows machine is fine, but you need to get data from the Wi-Fi router um, as well, right? And if there are any other devices in the home network from those as well, that's too difficult. We can't do that. So forget about it. Then I worked on other topics as well, but then even my paper started getting rejected because people said, oh, you're just, you don't have enough data, or I would create this you know, fake data in some sense. Um, and then they said, this is all fake data, give me some real data. But it was really difficult to get any real data at that point of time. And then <clears throat> there was this paradigm shift, right? Instead of using box products, instead of buying my software as a CD, now suddenly everything is on the cloud, right? I have services which run on the cloud. And I work for a company that runs a lot of these large services, uh, specifically, for instance, uh, Exchange, which is the backend which supports email for Outlook. I, I don't know if any of you use that, but Outlook is one of the primary email uh, services at, for enterprises in the world. So when the shift happened, right, suddenly there's huge amounts of data. Because services generate huge amounts of data in the form of logs, of events, uh, aggregate counters, config dumps, errors, exceptions, huge amounts of data, right? With that, you can work, process that to build diagnostics tools, do software engineering, uh, give software engineering insights, even build data structures based on this data, do configuration management. So there's a lot of stuff that can be done. So at that point of time, we started working on a project uh, called Sankey. And the idea was to do this data-driven DevOps for services. So DevOps is essentially development and operations. So if you look at any service, the, it, it goes through three broad stages. The first is development, where people actually write code. The second is testing, where you commit the code, and then you do some sort of um, large-scale testing of the commit and then you deploy and you monitor right so we collected data from all of these um, three different stages uh, actually that was already being collected then we also went and talked to these service operators and said tell us what your pain points are what are the problems that you're facing and they told us for instance they said when there's a service disruption it takes very uh, a very long time to actually root cause or determine what is causing the problem in the service. So that is just one example of a pain point. And then we had all this data from the services. We had all these pain points. We had to put together a bridge uh, between this. And that putting together a bridge was not easy. Uh, it took us months, years to do that. 
and finally we just uh, we we uh, did a bunch of work <coughs> on this uh, the the ones on the left here that i have outlined are tools that we used to give feedback to the developers when they were committing their code for instance we'd say oh you forgot to change this file because we found from past commits that these two files that you that uh, changed together almost all of the time you changed only the first file you need to change the second file too simple things like that right but simple things like that have helped in improving pull request completion time at microsoft by 20% so ideas are very simple they're low hanging fruit but imagine if you are increasing the development time or decreasing the development time by 20% that's the uh, that that was the impact this project had and it was great to have that impact um so i will talk briefly about one of the tools that we built here for root cause analysis uh, of large services okay first let me describe what the problem is like i said there's coding there's uh building and testing this you can think of that as the same thing and then there's deployment and finally after the deployment there's monitoring right now let's say there is a bug right if there's a bug we have anomaly detection algorithms that detect that this is a um, there's a bug in some code and then when that happens there's an alert which wakes up some uh, engineer who's on call at that time it's like on you have doctors who are on call right our services have on call on call folks as well <clears throat> and they can be woken up at 2 am in the morning also engineer wakes up and is pressure is under pressure to find and revert the commit which caused the bug so in exchange for instance there are hundreds of commits that happen every day so think about it one of those commits potentially had a bug which brought the entire service down now it's for this one on call engineer to figure out which one of those 200 commits that happened yesterday caused this downtime and revert it a very tough problem the person has to do it under a lot of pressure and they're not an, a domain expert perhaps on that one commit which came from somebody else right so that's the problem notice that this is not traditional debugging this is not the debugging problem all the on call engineer has to do is find the buggy commit and just take it out of deployment just revert it then offline off the critical path the developer actually goes and finds the bug and fixes it right this problem is different from that it's more of a localization problem and this can take hours for the reason i said because this one on call engineer may not have all the domain knowledge to do this all right so we built a tool called orca to help this on call engineer and the, this tool orca was based on one key observation that we had by going through uh, we we actually shadowed root cause uh, these on call engineers and their whole process for about 6 months and we found there's a textual similarity between the symptom of the problem and the code changes which caused it so what do i mean by that here's an example so let's say and you are running an email client on your phone and when you try to send email it gives you this cryptic message saying operation not supported for type mail id right now the reason why that this this happened the root cause really is that on the server side somebody changed this particular function call get mail session they added a new variable called bool a uh, boolean variable called return mail ids and support so essentially support for this data type mail id was added on the server side but not for this specific client that you are using on the phone and when you test you can't test every server client pair there's too many clients out there so this was not tested for but the observation is because there's all these uh, services right they have invested a lot in rich monitoring infrastructures and rich error generation so the error messages are much more meaningful now than they were 10 years ago right there's a, there's been a lot of work on generating rich information about failures essentially so that's why there is this textual similarity we observed 
between the symptom of the problem. In this case, it's the error message you got on the client side. And on this side, it's, it's uh, the server side change that you did in the code. You added this variable return mail ID. So that mail ID term is there. Essentially, that's the textual similarity. So uh, let me skip this for uh, want of time. So then essentially we built a search engine for localizing bugs where an on-call engineer can now type in anything like alert messages, customer complaints, exception messages, et cetera. And the documents in the search engine are, uh, the, the, you, do, you do a diffing of uh, code. Uh, let me see if I have time for that. Yeah, I'll, I'll go into that in the next slide. Uh, and I won't go into the graph bit. But essentially, you to create the documents to search on, you do some code diffing. And I'll talk about how we do this code diffing. OK. <clears throat> Let's say you had the code like so on the left, right? That's the old code. And then you changed it by adding these lines I have. Uh, outlined or uh, highlighted in green. Okay. Now, if you've used Git, GitHub, any of these tools, right? Uh, you can get a textual diff, right? And it it actually highlights the this the stuff that you added. But what we need is a syntactic diff. What we need is to know which class, which method, which class, which namespace has also changed not just the lines that have been added, but also the name of the function, the name of the class, et cetera, that have changed. So we collect all of that. So to do this, we have to uh, take abstract syntax trees and diff them. We collect all of the terms, like in this case, namespace is storage, class is connection, and the method is begin TX. <coughs> and then we uh, tokenize them. And we use simple IR, NL nat natural language processing techniques to build this code search engine now. The code search engine specific for root causing, specific for this bug localization that I explained to you. So these are some results. And uh, essentially, the search engine, we, sh we showed that when you, in real life problems that happened, the top reason or the actual code commit that caused the bug showed up between uh, <coughs> position one and two, pretty much. Yeah, so it was good. <coughs> but more importantly, we also found that uh, this tool reduced the amount of work for the on-call engineer threefold. And we got some pretty good feedback from the on-call engineers when this tool was actually deployed. So that felt really good. Um, so that was uh, that was a work which actually gave us the best paper award at OSDI. OK. The last bit, last technical uh, bit I want to tell you about <clears throat> is work I've been doing in the last two years or so. <clears throat> As you can understand, because of COVID, the pandemic, our services have grown exponentially in the last two years. Um, so when the service grows so big, the infrastructure that you need to support the service also has to grow as much. What that means for a company like Microsoft, Google, Amazon, is that costs also increase exponentially, right? Now. There, there is, it's always important to keep your costs down. If, if you can actually improve the efficiency of your services, then you keep your costs down, but you still keep your customers happy. So how can we increase our resource usage and resource efficiency without compromising user experience is the question that we ask, right? And the first piece of work we did in this space, we concentrated on the problem of wide area network provisioning. So let me tell you what I mean by network and wide area network and network provisioning. Okay. So this is a picture of the Microsoft wide area network, WAN for short. Right. 
So the little dots here are all the data centers where Azure, our cloud is deployed. Machines, data centers are deployed. And you see these dotted lines connecting them. They're all the network cables that we have invested in. And we own all of that. So in some cases, we also lease. And this thing here costs hundreds of millions of dollars per year. It's not cheap. Yes. So the ones in the oceans are under the sea, pretty much all of them. But you will also see on land cables as well, the connections. Yeah, so the over the last few years, right, these large cloud companies like Microsoft and Google especially are investing hugely in owning these cables as well. So there's a combination of leasing and owning, but some companies are really investing uh, a lot in owning because there's some value in owning these itself as well. <clears throat> so this is the network, right? Very expensive to own and maintain as well. Now you also have to decide uh, in the network, how much is the capacity of each of these links, right? And the more capacity you provision, the more you more expensive it becomes because you have to light up that fiber. If it's dark fiber, it's not that expensive, but lighting it up with uh, switches, routers, all sorts of networking equipment costs a lot of money. So you want to provision as little capacity on each of the, or on each of these uh, network links. Essentially, keep them as thin as possible, right? You don't want them to become too thick. So today, how is this done? How does a network operator determine how much capacity to put on a link? So the network operator in Azure observes how uh, the application, let's say email, <clears throat> the email service. Uh, so the network operator observes how the email service is using the network. So let's say the email service is using the network like that squiggly line that I've shown you here. I don't know why I chose the downward trend. Usually it's like upward trend. Um, and then the network operator says, all right, this is the usage over the last year or so. I'm going to do a forecast. I'm going to just project this for the next year. And that will tell me how much capacity this particular email application needs in the next year. So based on that, I'm going to provision so much capacity. That's how it is done currently. <clears throat> So this is sort of an implicit signal. But when the application here, which is email in our case exchange and the infrastructure, which in our case, in Microsoft's case is Azure, is owned by the same entity, why can't the application give a little more information to the network to make the provisioning more efficient? So that's the question we asked. And uh, we said, look, if the application can divide its usage into two, and tell us, okay, here's my usage, network usage, due to user-facing traffic. So for example, when you click an email, you need to have that email show up immediately, almost immediately. Otherwise, you, your user experience will suffer, uh, will suffer, will go bad. So that is that when you click on an email, then that creates network traffic. But that network traffic is user-facing in immediate, and it has to be delivered right then and there. So that is shown by the green line. That's immediate traffic. But then there are so many sources of what we call deferable traffic. For example, let's say one server is running very hot. Its usage is 99% or so. Then there's a load balancing component, which runs in the background, which will move your mailbox from this hot machine to a cooler machine. And that thing runs in the background can take enough time. It can go on, you know, it can take seven days to move your mailbox from one machine to the other, no problem. It's background traffic. So that is shown as this deferable component, which is in brown actually. <coughs> so if the application gives this information to the network, then the network can do a lot better in terms of provisioning. And let me try and explain why that is. Consider two data centers, in this case, DC1 and DC2. 
the way the forecasting is done bit for the traffic between dc1 and dc2 is like so so you notice say for january 2020 the bandwidth used by the email application was this squiggly line then you see the peak usage for january 2020 and then you plot that as one point on this graph on the right so you plot one point for every month so and then you get this line right and then you just forecast it out so you so essentially you see the peak usage for every month plot it and then project that out for say another year so that's how you do the forecasting right now and the estimation of how much capacity you need what we observed is this you can do this time shifting if you know what is your deferable traffic <coughs> so instead of peak we're going to show how you can use this lower num this red line to do your forecasting so essentially we say that uh, the all the traffic above the red line could actually have moved into the valleys and we would still be fine because our deferable traffic like i said the load balancing traffic can wait for seven days right so if you move all of that traffic into the valleys you're fine because the valley is just one day later your traffic is still reaching within seven days so instead of using the peak of what i used in january 2020 had my capacity been at the red level i would still have been fine so in, so i won't use peak provisioning anymore i'll figure out this red level for each month and plot that instead which will be lower and so i'm going to save on or i'm going to project much lower values in my forecast and therefore provision less capacity on my network so this is one trick we used uh so the there's one more trick but let me skip that because i want some time for questions as well yeah no actually uh, yeah i i did not have the time to make that clear all this is happening in retrospect so you at you just say at a very uh, high level that any traffic that's coming from this component in my service my load balancing component you can specify that as a five tuple in networks uh, any of that traffic is deferable by seven days that's all you don't have to label each packet no, no. My question is, how does it come, come into conflict with net neutrality or something in the sense that I uh, both suppose that I have both users of Microsoft Cloud Services. He have a premium user, and I have to respond. Why doesn't this prevent Microsoft from just labeling all my requests as deferable requests? And yeah. yeah, great point. So uh, we are not okay. So two answers to your uh, question. First answer is that uh, we are doing this only for Microsoft's own traffic okay so we don't do this for our third party customers so let's say you are netflix and your amazon or oh, amazon not good example hotstar let's say both of you use azure to host your services we're not going to do this at that level we're just doing this for exchange sharepoint all our internal properties so that there's no notion of uh, you know being unfair to our customers it's all internal so internally the load balancing team in exchange will say it's all right for me to wait seven days for you to deliver traffic and i'm doing that in microsoft's interest because microsoft will as a whole will save money if i do that so it's a very cooperative uh, environment so that is one answer to your question i had another answer but i can't remember what that was so i'll just defer that so something like uh, the application writers etc will be saying that here is my application which is going to make many sort of communications yeah but these are communications that i can't defer yes but these are communications that i don't mind deferring for a certain time period yes yes and that information will then be used by the system correct that's right so that whole process doesn't have to happen too often so in our case for instance what we've done is uh we spoke to multiple component owners within exchange our email service and they told us that yeah it's all right if you postpone this by seven days 
Another component owner said, I can do as much as one day. Another person said six months. So depending on the kind of traffic, the deadline also varies. And it's also subjective because it's up to that domain, uh, the, the component owner to decide what that value is. So I'll end my talk there. And uh, there are a few things I wanted to say about in general. You know, a lot of people have asked me in the past, how do I choose a PhD topic? How do I go about it? Uh, one thing I've realized is that uh, every put, everybody's path is different. Uh, like I was telling uh, yeah, there somebody at yesterday's mentoring session, I took four years to determine my PhD topic, right? So, but there are some rules, some fundamental rules one can follow. So one is to keep asking yourself what you would like, where you would like to be two years from now. So roughly short term and also 10 years from now. So just once in six months, just ask yourself, am I doing the right thing given my goals for two years and given my goals for 10 years? That is one thing. The second is to choose judicially, judiciously what you're working on. Now, you, it's very difficult to know exactly uh, what the, the topic that you're working on right now, is that the right topic or not? You can't, right? But sometimes you choose a topic, you choose a topic in which you're inherently interested and you're good at, right? Everybody has their uh, strong points and weak points. So choose something that you're good at and something that interests you. Um, and even better, if you can ask <clears throat> very objectively whether that topic will be of interest a few years from now. Either it's hot now, which is fine, but even better if you can find something that will be hot uh, in a couple of years. Very difficult to do, I know. Uh, but just ask, right? You may not know the answer, but at least ask the question. Finally, persevere. I've uh, And I've been guilty of this, right? Where I work on something for uh, two months or three months and I say, oh, forget this. This is not interesting. Let me move on. Try not to do that. Um, and forgive yourself for time wasted. So sometimes we spend six months and a year and we look back and say, oh, we achieved nothing. Um, but that's, that nothing time is also not really nothing. There is something we learn even when we take breaks, uh, when we are doing our PhDs or anything you're doing for that matter, where you're not extremely productive, but that's fine, right? So with that, uh, I'll end. And if there are any questions, I can take them. Tracking music, anything. OK. So I wanted to do a shameless plug at this point. Uh, to the Microsoft Research India Research Fellow Program. Again, something I spoke about uh, yesterday. This is a two-year pre-doc program where you get a taste of computer science research. You can come try out different kinds of uh, projects ranging from theoretical computer science all the way to applied uh, systems research, the stuff I spoke about, for instance. Um, uh, most research fellows that we have, we have about 50 to 60 of them right now. And they apply for higher studies, masters at least, if not a PhD. But some do other st cool stuff as well, such as starting their own companies. Uh, we're going to get applications around Jan 2023. We're going to ask for applications in Jan 2023. And here's the website for that. Correct. That's true. This is immediately after your undergrad or your master's? Both work. Okay. Yeah, yeah. So, uh, in many of the projects that you mentioned, uh, some of it felt like there were there were a lot of very diverse components that you needed to be very familiar with. Yes. In order to eventually see them. So, are these components that sort of you know you you became an expert in while you were working on this or? But I, yeah, I, I won't say I became an expert on them, but you're right. So for instance, the last piece of work that we did, right, we had to understand how the load balancing component worked. If we went to them and said, we'll defer your uh, traffic forever, they would not be happy. So we had to figure out and we had this back and forth on what the right deadline should be, for instance. So we had to understand how the load balancing worked. 
we had to understand how the Azure network provisioning works currently. How do the operators actually do that? They have a pipeline. They do some sort of failure simulations and we needed to understand that. We also needed to understand how currently the bandwidth is regulated. So when um, the part that I didn't speak about, there's lots of stuff that you need to do where you need to send now information from the networking layer to the application layer to stop sending traffic, which didn't exist earlier. So we had to put all that plumbing and all of that needed us to understand a lot of these components. So it's taken a while and it's still not fully deployed, but hopefully in the next few months, it will be fully deployed. Uh, but yeah, it takes. Uh, like when you started working on the Kubernetes, did you know that no. the components that were... No idea, right? So it's taken three years. All right. So, which I want to ask the commenter to put some comments to your talk on. So, there are two researchers come of multiple flavors. The raw flavor is also the ambient they sort of work in, whether they are researchers like you who work in the industry and stuff, and the researchers like us who work in a very academic environment, and each has its advantages. And one, one thing which we are extremely envious of good people, especially in today's world. Is you have access to these large systems because yes. they are on the <laughs> we have access to grad students. Yes. <laughs> yeah. So we are envious because of that. <laughs> yeah. So yeah. So the grad students again, you learn new things every few years, you change topics and stuff. Yeah. So if you could comment on more on this sort of research career, both of because most of the inputs we've been giving is research from academia side. It's yeah. If you can talk about yeah. the talk of course exemplifies this that being all of this is feasible because you are at Microsoft. Exactly. So um, I do get asked questions, for instance, when I give talks like this, you know, what is there, what can I gain from it as an academic, right? How do I take some of your ideas and apply it? Because all of this data nowadays actually, unfortunately, is owned by corporates, right? If you look at the amount of data that Google has or Amazon has, Microsoft has it for enterprise customers more than consumers, right? It's just vast. You can't even begin to imagine how much data there is. So that is obviously a huge, huge plus for us right now at this current point of time, which wasn't true 10 years ago, which might not be true 10 years from now. So that's a huge plus point for us. Um, but uh, also, I mean, this works for me. That, uh, that I like taking real problems that the services folks give us. And I like working on those. But that does sort of limit the sort of problems you can work on, right? So there are, of course, people in Microsoft research, you know, who might be trying to prove P is equal to NP or not, right? But the far and few between, and they're stellar researchers. <laughs> For the rest of us, uh, but for this works for me. I really love doing this, so I'm there, right? But if you don't like doing that and you would like to do something much more uh, independent of problems that are uh, faced by these 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 service providers right now, then academic research is a great place to be. Right? So that those are the two main, you know, the main plus for where we are right now, and the main negative. But the negative for me really is a positive. So it depends on what you like to do. Yes. So security. Um, so you've asked a rather vast question. So, I, uh, so security is a huge field. So a company like Microsoft is doing all sorts of things in the uh, in the security space itself to ensure uh, uh, ensure that your data is kept encrypted, etc. So there are a lot of compliance requirements that these companies have to provide, um, and uh, specifically, you know, also uh, depending on the rules of the countries that you operate in, right? So and there are lots of projects in the security space. So maybe I'll, I'm going to turn your question around to what are the big problems uh, in data security these days, right? So making sure that um, 
that data is uh, always safe and it it's there's always this compliance this compliance necessities and making sure that all the data is always matching the compliance necessities is a very difficult problem to solve right now um then uh, there's another interesting aspect not necessarily security but in crypto where uh, you want to do uh, secure machine learning all right so let's say you have some data that you don't want to disclose to anybody because it's proprietary to you but then this the service has a model a machine learning model which they don't want to disclose to anybody because it's proprietary to them then how can you use your data and feed it into that model to get a label or to do some inference processing on so that is also an interesting interesting problem in secure and private machine learning secure ml private ml are two really big fields of uh, research these days so there's not too much in on the product space on the product space compliance is a big deal on the research side i think secure and private ml is very important Question. Yeah. Great question. Great question. Uh, depends on the research lab that you're working in um, and your expertise. So the research lab that you're working in may be hiring you for your expertise in, let's say, theory of machine learning. If that is the case, then you work on, on what your expertise is. And so you choose your topics within that theory of machine learning space, right? Um, but as if if you're a systems researcher like myself right there is there is an inherent expectation that you i pick my own problems okay so i do pick my own problems but there is an expectation from my manager and their manager that i will pick problems that will have impact on the company maybe not tomorrow or day after actually better if it's not tomorrow or day after it should be impactful 5 years or 10 years down the line so uh, yes, everybody can pick their own projects, at least in Microsoft Research. It's a very bottom-up org, right? You pick your own projects, but at the end of the day, you have to pick projects that are impactful and can potentially impact Microsoft five years or 10 years down the line. Yeah. Um, so I don't have, I hardly have any management kind of meetings with my manager, for instance, right? So in some sense, it's a little more loose. The management structure is looser. Uh, so I have people who I'm also, I manage about seven or eight people now. And, um, I don't tell them what to do. They tell me what they're doing every two weeks. I have I meet with them once in two weeks. They tell me what they do. Um, and I maybe I have discussions around that. So it's much more loose from that point of view. But uh, that said, right, I wanted to point out one thing um, here. So a lot of my work has been, at least in the recent past, has been in, in collaboration with product groups. And while working with the product groups, I have really learned to appreciate, you know, the pains that, and the, the restrictions that they work in. They're extremely competent and extremely smart people who are building these products for us. Um, and it's great to see how, it's, how different it is and yet challenging. So even if it's not, though it's not research, it's a very, very challenging, they're working on really challenging problems and understanding their restrictions, for example, if a solution I give, give them has very high engineering complexity or even slight engineering complexity, they'll say, we can't do it. And I appreciate, I appreciate that now much more than I did 
five or ten years ago. People had to work in there uh, with a bunch of um, limitations, right, or um, guardrails. So that's another thing I've learned over the years. Okay, related to that, about the choice of problem and industry research labs, Krishna would ask it more. Even among industry research labs, there are different kinds of research labs. Yeah. And first, that the IBM and Microsoft are really different the way they operate. For example, third, I don't know if you should correct me if I'm wrong. In IBM, the research group actually, most of their problems, they should get it from their respective product groups. Yeah. And that's how they, in fact, generate the sort of funding for their respective Yes. Groups. Whereas Microsoft is a little more. Oh, this one about most researchers are free to do whatever they want. It, yeah. Could come, come and come. So, uh, uh, yeah. So I, I, not I, in particular based to organizations, but in general, how research problems are chosen in industry research. That's right. So IBM, uh, I think you're right. I, you know, I was at IBM long time ago, so it's, it'll be very difficult for me to comment on so their current process. IBM research, and okay. that's where I get this piece of information. Yeah, so that's true. The other uh, model is Google Research. <laughs> so Google Research uh, reports into the product group. So uh, the they hire researchers, they hire PhDs, but they work very closely with the product themselves. Uh, that's another model. And then there is the Microsoft Research model, which uh, gives you freedom definitely to choose your topic, but you also have to choose it judiciously, especially if you're a systems researcher. You have to think about what problem you're solving, uh, have that impact thing. Uh, so there are pluses and minuses of all, but I really don't, I mean, uh, the Google model, right, for instance, is interesting because when you are part of the same organization, you are much more in the thick of things about understanding the problem better, um, getting data, for instance, it becomes a little easier, I think. I could be wrong. Uh, it's a fine model. I, I think all of them are fine. It's just different in different places. Even in Microsoft Research, for instance, some different labs have different uh, ways of selecting projects to work on. Whatever works. I can't say one is better than the other. Yes. So, uh, especially when you started with uh, the work on peer-to-peer -peer networks and uh, how sort of there were these paradigm shifts that happened which you have to sort of sort of be, try to be prepared yes. for and so on. So yes. I started with a lot of this data driven uh, approaches and stuff. I mean I mean I just I mean I guess a very vague question that I have is the sense that there is always this worry that you know the data that you have available right now is something that perhaps will not be you know is not something that will be so easily available. Maybe due to you know, privacy regulations or various other things that may happen. Mm -hmm. Whereas it also feels like the amount, the amount of effort that is put into getting this, you know, this, I mean, there are lots of components that you need to get into. So the, the I mean, the life cycle of the whole process is also fairly long. Yes. So it seems like, you know, there needs to be some way of coping up with this possibility of something, there being a sudden paradigm shift. You know, in a couple of years or something like that. So I was just wondering if there is something consciously that you, is this something that you think about or is it something like there will always be new problems, interesting problems to solve and something that we will we'll take it as it comes. So. Um, yeah, I mean, I think we follow the, there, there are a couple of things. One is the data that you build or build upon or take dependencies on. We try to keep that data as simple as possible. Um, and also, it should not have any personally identifiable information or organization identifiable information, which will have more privacy and compliance issues. So we do uh, try and keep our techniques simple enough so that they can use simple data, which should not fall under this bracket where it suddenly becomes unavailable. So that is one thing we, we cannot do very complex things. For this is one reason. The other is the engineers will then say, we can't do this in our system. We can't put it in. Um, and this works also because, I mean, in systems research, right, there's nothing really super complex. We, we use simple ideas, just reuse them over and over again, and it seems to work. So um, 
but this is this is one uh, conscious decision we uh, take which is keep the data requirements simple and keep the engineering requirements simple beyond that uh, i've had projects die because of various reasons right data is just one of them very often the biggest reason why <clears throat> projects don't go as expected is because of personal issues either the person who was your contact on the product group side leaves or joins another organization within the same company or their priorities change over time product group priorities change right they say okay you are start, you are working on the storage system highly available storage system but now that's not important for us anymore we have to build a highly performant storage system those things happen all the time that's not in your control so we don't even think about that Thank you. Thank you.